housekeeping here first, move things around. So my name is Perry, and I think it's important that you know who's standing here in front of you this morning. Um, my wife and I attend the Calvary Free Church in Broomfield, and we've been there probably about 30 years. Uh, been there a long time, seen a lot of things happen, a lot of things change there. Uh, we live in Brighton, so don't judge me. I am a flatlander. Uh, love the mountains, but my wife wanted horses, and that's where we ended up. So, um, It is my honor and privilege this morning to bring you God's word. I am an elder at our church, and I actually serve as the chairman of our elder board, uh, which is also the chairman of our church. Uh, and as a result... There's a handful of us that get to preach occasionally, once, once, maybe a year, maybe twice. So when I get the opportunity, I like to take full advantage of it. So trust me, this will be the quickest 75 minutes <laughs> you have experienced in quite some time. Now, I know that uh, Pastor Nate has been taking you through uh, the parables. And it looked like last week he took you through the cost of discipleship. Well, today we're going to look at a promise of God that I think you can see as a benefit of discipleship. So we're going to be in the book of John, chapter 10 this morning. And I don't, as I said, I don't get to do this very often. Um, but I, I wish each of you could. I wish each of you could go through the process of preparing and delivering a sermon. Because every time I do it, God blesses me in ways that, you know, I don't normally experience. He shows me more about myself. He shows me more about himself. And he shows me more about his relationship than I would normally see on just a given day. So I would, I would wish that on all of you, that you would get the opportunity to prepare and deliver a sermon. Martin Luther said there are three needs um, for understanding the study of Scripture. The prayer, meditation, and I don't mean sitting with your eyes closed and going, you know, meditating on the Word of God, meditating on God. And lastly, testing and affliction. And I think Luther nailed it. Um, I would desire the same thing for you, that you would experience those things. I had to really examine areas of my life as I prepared this. God showed me things that I didn't really want to see. Um, but as a result, I think I am more refined because of it. And uh, I hope that you will be too. If you are a note taker, I'll give you my three points right up front here. You can leave some space in between them. Number one, this promise applies to believers. Those people that have trusted on Christ's redemptive act on the cross, and they rely on his sacrifice to pay for their sin. Number two, this promise is fully available to those of us that are believers. And number three, we willingly give up this promise on a regular basis. So before we get into our passage, would you, uh, would you pray with me? Gracious, merciful, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God, you are holy and just, you are righteous, there is none like you. This morning as we look at, our, at your word, as we look at your promises, I pray that you would speak to each of us, change our lives as a result. May the words that I speak be yours, and I ask that you work through me this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, point number one. This is for believers. Hopefully you have found your way to John chapter 10, verse 10 this morning. Um, this verse is actually a part of a long narrative. It starts at the beginning of John chapter 9 and runs all the way down to verse 21 in chapter 10. So um, a long discussion of what's going on here. Our verse this morning reads, The thief comes with the sole intention of stealing and killing and destroying. But I came to bring them life, and far more life than before. That's it. One simple sentence. 
I'm going to be using the J.B. Phillips translation. I have been using uh, that translation this summer as I've been reading through the Word of God through the New Testament. And uh, I hope that you will enjoy J.B. Phillips' translation this morning along with me. Now, I was at lunch with a friend of mine recently, and uh, he's a retired pastor. And he was asking me about this sermon. He's like, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, you know, I've kind of got this idea. I think I'll go here. And he stopped me <laughs> right in the middle of my sentence. And he was like patting on the table. He says, you need to drive a truck right through the middle of the gospel. Because this verse is totally predicated on the fact that you need to be a believer. And so I thought about that. And I thought, you know what? He's right. This verse is meaningless if you're not a believer in Christ. If you haven't put your faith in him, this is a meaningless verse. The words, Jesus' words are, I came to bring them life, and far more life than before. And your translation probably uses the words, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And that's typically how we hear that verse. And the implication here is that you need to accept the life that Christ gives you. It's no good for someone to offer you a gift if you don't take it. Jesus came, lived a perfect life, and died on a cross as the willing payment for our sins. We're all sinners. We sang about it this morning. We're all separated from God because of it. Jesus came to reconcile us to God so that we can have a relationship with him. What we have to do is accept the gift that Jesus gave us. Jesus' proclamation that he came to give us far more life than before only applies if you have accepted the sacrifice he made and put your trust in him for your salvation. And if you haven't done that, you have allowed the thief to enter in, to rob, to kill, and destroy And unless you change things, that, unfortunately, is your lot in life. The fact of the matter is, the gospel is at the heart of this passage. And without it, this passage would mean nothing. Point number two, this promise is available to all believers. I don't want you to get your hopes up. The second two points are much longer than the first one. (laughs) As I said, our verse is part of a larger narrative. It begins um, at the beginning of chapter 9, and it continues down past our verse, down to verse 21 of chapter 10. And I'm not going to go into much detail about all of that um, that narrative there, but um, you can read it for yourselves, and I would encourage you to read it for yourselves. It's a great, it's a great passage. In chapter 9, we see Jesus giving sight to a man born blind, and Jesus does this, as he so often does, on the Sabbath. And they present the blind man to the Pharisees and the church leaders, and as they so often do, they accuse Jesus of not being from God because he's working on the Sabbath. They ignore what, is, what has happened, and they look at, just, they look at the, you know, the legal aspects of things. And Anyway... Um, There are great lines in that narrative. Some of the things the man says back to the Pharisees and the leaders of the church, um, they're pretty fun. And I I would encourage you to read it. At the end of chapter 9, Jesus and the man hook up again. And uh, and Jesus is talking to the man and the Pharisees overhear them. And uh, they hear him tell the man, my coming into this world is, is itself a judgment. Those who cannot see have their eyes opened, and those who think they can see become blind. And the Pharisees hear him say this, and they say, what? Are we blind too? And Jesus says, if you were blind, nobody could blame you. But as you insist, we can see, your guilt remains. And this starts the discourse that we get into in chapter 10, and we get to our verse. And Jesus talks about protecting his sheep, providing for his sheep. He contrasts himself with a thief, starting in verse 1 of chapter 10. And then Jesus said, Believe me when I tell you that anyone who does not enter the sheepfold through the door, but climbs in through some other way, is a thief and a rogue. 
It is the shepherd of the flock who goes in by the door. It is him, the doorkeeper, opens the door, and it is his voice that the sheep recognize. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out of the fold, and when he has driven all his flock outside, he goes in front of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice, and they will never follow a stranger. Indeed, they will run away from him, for they do not recognize strange voices. Jesus gave them this illustration, but they did not grasp the point of what he was saying to them. Jesus said to them once more, I do assure you that I myself am the door for the sheep. All who have gone before me are like thieves and rogues, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If a man goes in through me, he will be safe and sound. He will come in and out and find his food. The thief comes in with the sole intention of stealing, killing, and destroying. But I came to bring them life, and far more life than before. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd will give his life for the sake of his sheep. In chapter 9, we see Jesus giving sight to a blind man. In chapter 10, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd, one that not only lays down his life for his sheep, which Jesus did, but also one that keeps them safe and sound and fed. He provided the blind man with life, and far more life than before, and he provides his sheep with life and more of it. Let me ask you a question. What does abundant life look like to you? Just think about that for just a second. Be honest with yourselves. When, when you hear the term abundant life, what do you think about? You got a picture of what it looks like? What's the first thing that jumped into your mind? How many of you pictured a life with things like physical well-being, financial security, nice house in a nice neighborhood, good friends, a great relationship with your families, jobs you love? I think if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us go down that path. We look around and we see what others have, we want it for ourselves. You know, it's true that God has blessed some people with riches. Not me. <laughs> some people with exquisite bodies. Well, maybe so. <laughs> Pastor Nate and I share that. <laughs> some with picture-perfect families. Uh, these things may be temporal. They're not internal, though. I would even go so far as to say that these things maybe an illusion. And Elon Musk is the richest man in the world. He runs companies the way he wants to run them. His ideas become reality. He's influential and people look to him. He can have anything he wants. Elon Musk's marriages have ended in three divorces. He's had affairs while married. He's had several failed relationships outside of marriage with women. And I just saw an interview with him the other day, and it was sad. Uh, he was obviously in pain. He was talking about losing his son to gender dysphoria. He said they call it dead naming because the name of his son is dead. The perfect life is oftentimes an illusion. The fact of the matter is Jesus never promised us the sorts of things we imagine as an abundant life. In fact, many of you will recall that Jesus tells those following him that there will be things like trouble and persecution and division. In John 16, 33, you will find trouble in the world. There will be persecution. In John 5, 10, happy are those who have suffered persecution for the goodness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. There will be persecution. I'm sorry. Then there will be division. Luke 12, 51 53, we read, Do you think that I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, not peace, but division. For from now on, there will be five people divided against each other in one house. Three against two and two against three. It's a pretty sharp contrast to what we picture as abundant life. 
What Jesus tells his followers what it's going to be is very different than what we think. So what is abundant life? Or as Phillips puts it, life and far more of it. Jesus talks about it right after he heals the blind man. So is it physical well-being? Jesus clearly gave physical well-being to many people. Physical healing is a big part of the Gospels. We see Jesus going through and healing people of all sorts of things. Giving sight to the blind man, man born blind, it begins this narrative, and it's a great example, and I think it fits well with the analogy of a good shepherd. It takes care of his flocks. He provides them with food, shelter, and safety. But physical healing in itself doesn't really address the recipient's spiritual need. Nor did it apply to all that believed. Not everybody was physically healed. So what did he mean, life and far more life than before? I believe that life and far more life than before consists of two parts. An eternal part and a better way of living our lives here on earth. And I think this is consistent with the whole of Scripture. From the beginning, God wanted his creation to be in relationship to him. Look at Genesis 3. God walks in the garden because he wants to be with his creation. From the very beginning, he wanted that. Even today, he wants us to honor him, to love him, uh, with the end result being life um, with him here on earth and in eternity. Let me tell you what I think abundant life is. If you turn forward into your Bibles to um, the letter to the Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 22. The Spirit, however, produces in human life fruits such as these. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, fidelity, tolerance, self-control, and no law exists against any of them. Those who belong to Christ have crucified their old nature with all that it loved and lusted for. Think about our original vision of abundant life. If our lives are centered in the Spirit, let let us be guided by the Spirit. Life, and far more life than before, is life in relationship with God. A life that trusts God, a life that relies on God. The fruits of the Spirit are what far more life than before look like. A life that is indwelled with the Spirit can experience love and joy and peace, no matter what the circumstances are around them. A life that's indwelled with the Spirit exhibits life and far more life than before through acts of patience, Kindness, generosity, fidelity, self-control. Imagine going to bed at night and not worrying about what you're going to face tomorrow. Imagine experiencing joy no matter what the circumstances are that you're in. Imagine loving and not hating. Imagine your life treating people with kindness and generosity. Imagine being patient with those around you. Imagine life and far more life than before. Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, has offered all believers all of these things. We can claim them. We can experience them. So why don't we? Point number three. We give it this promise on a regular basis. Remember the first part of our verse says the thief comes with the sole intention of stealing and killing and destroying We allow our abundant life to be taken from us. Jesus talks about the thief. He's talking about Satan. And he will tempt us. He will plant the seeds of destruction. And unfortunately, we allow those seeds to grow. And I'm going to be so bold as to say, we choose to do that. Before you think to yourself, oh, baloney, I don't do that. Think again. I want to look at two very common ways we allow abundant life to be stolen from us. For some of us, 
These may be ways that we choose to have abundant life taken from us. How many of you get grumpy? <laughs> oh, believe it or not, I have been accused of being grumpy myself. And uh, I know it seems hard to believe, but I have had people say that. I think this is a self-induced malady. I think that a lot of men, in particular, suffer from it. Um, those of you that get grumpy, let me ask you a few questions. Now, why do you get grumpy? And of course, I'm asking because of, for a friend, and I, I don't. <laughs> but why do you get grumpy? What is the root cause of your grumpiness? If you look down deep inside, um, and you ask yourself that question, I have asked this question before, and I've heard answers like, well, things didn't go the way I had uh, planned, or the way that I wanted, uh, or something that I don't like to do causes our grumpiness. We look at the fruits of the Spirit, and I said those fruits are, those fruits are a picture of what abundant life looks like for the believer. Well, there is another side to that coin, the deeds of the flesh. And they are listed just before the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. God has placed these two lists right next to each other so that we can easily contrast the two, compare and contrast them. A life in the flesh, you can compare that, a self-serving life to a life of the, in the Spirit, a life in service to God and others. Think about the root cause of your grumpiness as I go through this list. So in Galatians 5, starting at verse 19. The activities of the lower nature are obvious. Here is a list. Sexual immorality, impurity of mind, sensuality, worship of false gods, witchcraft, hatred, quarreling, jealousy, bad temper, rivalry, factions, party spirit, enviousness, drunkenness, orgies and things like that. I solemnly assure you, as I did before, that those who indulge in such things will never inherit the kingdom of God. Well, did any of those strike a chord as I was reading through them? When you think about the root cause for your grumpiness, did anything strike a chord to you? For me, things like hatred, jealousy, bad temper, they tend to come into play. But for me, it really boils down to something else. It really boils down to selfishness. When I examine the reasons why, if I'm honest with myself, I always come down to a list of eyes. I don't like, I don't want, I'd rather be doing something else, I don't deserve, I, I, I. Let me ask you a few more questions. How does your grumpiness make you feel? How does your grumpiness affect your relationships with those around you? How does it affect your relationship with your walk with Christ? How does it affect your relationship with God? Does your grumpiness rob you of abundant life? It was a rhetorical question, in case you didn't know. Here's another one, which like grumpiness, um, I know a lot of people nurture. They allow it to happen. They hang on to it. And for some people, <laughs> it's amazing. For some people, this is like a warm blanket for them. Worry. I expect that that hit home with a few. We worry about things that might happen. We worry about things that might not happen. We worry about things that will happen to people we know. We worry about things that might not happen to people we know. We worry about too many things. I want to ask you another question again. Why do you spend time worrying? What did you come up with? Lack of trust in God? Maybe he said we don't trust God with our lives because we haven't handed our lives over to God. 
And we can't trust God because of it. Matthew and Luke record Jesus addressing worry when he asked, can any of you make himself an inch taller, however much he worries about it? How many hours, days, and weeks have you wasted worrying? When you worry, do you experience the joys of the spirit? The spirit? Do you experience joy? Do you experience peace? Do you rob yourself from the fruits of the Spirit, from abundant life, when you willingly give in to worry. You know, I've talked about those two big things, but I expect that you can name others as well. Sexual immorality, impurity of mind, sensuality, quarreling, jealousy. The list goes on and on. Each and every one of us, each and every one of these robs us from the promise of abundant life. And as a real old, Part of us is destroyed. Part of us is killed. And what about other ways that we rob ourselves or we allow ourselves to be robbed of abundant life? What things do we chase after in this life in an effort to have what we think is abundant life? What about ways that we rob ourselves, we allow ourselves to be robbed? How many of us think that being physically fit will give us abundant life? It certainly could be good for us. We feel better. We can round easier. We might even live longer. But if we subs- what if we substitute time in the Word and time in prayer with time in the gym? How many of us chase after financial security, building up a strong investment portfolio, having wealth, Again, not a bad thing in itself. Wealth can certainly do things to make our lives easier. It can give us the freedom to do things that we may not have otherwise been able to do. We can help people financially. We can give to charities. We can do nice things for our loved ones. What if our pursuit of riches gets in the way of our relationship with God? What if rather than spending time in the Word and spending time in prayer... You're spending time sitting in front of a computer, moving money around and watching the markets. Think about your lives. There are things that you